In today's conversation with Professor Robert E. May, Professor Emeritus of History, Purdue University, we will examine the America in which Wallingford, Connecticut native son, Moses Yale Beach, came of age in and influenced the antebellum era from the War of 1812 to the Civil War. To provide our viewers with some context, Moses Yale Beach was born at the turn of the 19th century in January 1800 and died approximately three years after Lincoln was assassinated in 1868. While Professor May will help us understand this antebellum period of history, we know that our collective understanding continues to be transformed. Many recent works have contributed new insights into the years 1846 to 1848, the middle of Mr. Beach's editorial control of the penny paper, The Sun. Recent books like The Dead March, A History of the Mexican-American War by Peter Gardino, and South to Freedom, Runaway Slaves to Mexico, and The Road to the Civil War by Alice Baumgarten, and The War Before the War, Fugitive Slaves and the Struggle for America's Soul by Andrew Del Banco, have newly influenced the teaching of this period by adding the voices of the slaves and the people of Mexico, a Mexico that included Texas and California. There is a lot to unpack. Indeed, many books have been written. Let us begin briefly with the War of 1812 and America's victory over the British, starting with the economic and political forces of the time, which may have influenced the imaginings of a young man seeking independence from an agrarian life. Professor Robert May, Welcome again. And uh, our first question, thank you, Professor. Our first question, how would you characterize what some have described as a period of entrepreneurial spirit? I think it's an accurate uh, description of the United States during the antebellum period. Uh, and certainly Moses Yale Beach personifies that spirit in so many different ways. I mean, we have a man who tries many different ventures. We shouldn't just think of him as the editor of The Sun. Uh, we need to think of him as a man who tried cabinet making, who was involved in, a, in an unsuccessful uh, paper mill project. He was important in the newspaper world, and uh, we've talked a lot about his innovations, like his involvement in the forming of the Associated Press, his leadership in that, and his role in, in, in the Pony Express. Uh, during the, the Mexican War in the East. We all think of the Pony Express as something that took the mail to California, but uh, there were other Pony Expresses. So, so he was very innovative in his newspaper work, and we've talked about his use of carrier pigeons and the like, but it goes way beyond that. He also was uh, involved in banking, and not just one bank. You might think uh, it'd be typical to be involved with one bank. He was involved with four or five different, he was a, a director four different banks at one point. He had an interest in cross isthmian transportation in Central America in, in the time before the Panama Canal, getting news across Central America, getting a mail across Central America, uh, getting baggage uh, and goods across Central America or Mexico, the, the southern part of Mexico, which is very narrow, the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. And, and so he had those kinds of interests. And, and then that played out uh, after the Mexican War. Now, he played such an important role during the Mexican War. And then all of a sudden, uh, because of the Mexican War, we gained permanent ownership of California. And then they immediately uh, find, find gold there. And all of a sudden, people are rushing there to get rich off the gold. And smart entrepreneurs say, well, uh, we can get rich off the people Getting, going to California to get rich off the gold. And we can do it by selling goods and other things. So he actually uh, fits out a packet ship out to California. Uh, I think they're in the San Francisco Bay Area, if I remember right. And uh, they rent out the ship as a storehouse and so on and so forth. Here you have a man, he's definitely reflective of his age. Uh, when, when he sees opportunities, he seizes on them, he's imaginative. He represents America. And I might then say, what makes America that way? Well, you can, of course, uh, trace it all the way back to the nation's founding fathers. 
uh, you, uh, you, you're dealing in the beginning with people like George Washington and Alexander Hamilton. What perfect examples of the entrepreneurial uh, uh, spirit. We, we don't think of George Washington so much as an entrepreneur. We think of him as, as president, of course, but as a general in the revolution and as a Virginia planter. Uh, and we don't usually think of uh, Southern slaveholders as being particularly entrepreneurial because they, uh, they have slaves to do the work, so they don't have the great incentive to develop technology and so much. Actually, they were very uh, entrepreneurial. Uh, John Calhoun of Moses Beach's era uh, invested in gold mines. And, and George Washington just got involved in all sorts of land speculations out west in the Ohio River Valley. And he, of course, once he did that, he was interested in communication with the West. And so he got involved in a, a canal uh, company in Virginia to improve the Potomac River and to get around the falls. And this canal company eventually, long after his death, would wind up as the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal. So he's an entrepreneur. And then who does he appoint as Secretary of the Treasury but a northerner, the New Yorker Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton's got the same kind of spirit. He came originally from the West Indies, comes to New York for his education. Uh, when he's Secretary of the Treasury, he wants to stimulate manufacturing in the country so he won't be dependent on Great Britain, the mother country, the former mother country any longer. So he proposes that we should have bounties to help people set up factories paid for by the federal government, things like that. He himself uh, decided to set up a whole factory town uh, looking for the power to propel the town. He comes up with the falls of the Passaic River in New northern New Jersey, and he's going to produce their uh, paper and textiles and all sorts of things using the, uh, the power generated uh, from the water uh, going over the falls of the Passaic. And, and, and it's a big, big undertaking in what becomes eventually Patterson, New Jersey. My, my point is simply, we were founded by entrepreneurs. And then during Beach's era, the governments, both state and federal, do a heck of a lot to encourage Americans to become entrepreneurs. And what do, I, what do I mean? Well, first of all, they like, like with Hamilton's plan, they subsidize a lot of the development of the country. So you have subsidizing, for instance, of the building of roads, like the National Road, which linked the East with the Midwest and went through Indiana, near where I used to teach. You have uh, uh, government uh, subsidizing of, of uh, building of canals. You have government uh, subsidizing the building of railroads, and eventually, right before his death, uh, the, uh, the Transcontinental Railroad. And so you've got government subsidies and all sorts of other encouragement. The government uh, encourages people to settle new areas and develop them, and it does this by constantly reducing the price of land. Uh, and the number of acres you had to buy to buy federal land. Uh, I don't know of a single instance where the price of land went up uh, between the founding of the country in 1789 uh, and uh, Beach's uh, death, but public land sales went down in price over time in different stages, and also the amount you had to buy in one sitting, which means you didn't have to have a lot of money in the bank, which certainly encouraged uh, entrepreneurs, people of modest means uh, to get into land speculation. Uh, so the government encouraged it that way. And of course, the government paid for the surveys of the land that made the settlement possible. So the government is encouraging entrepreneurs of all kinds. And then you have Supreme Court decisions uh, that uh, further uh, encourage people to invest and do things. Supreme Court decisions like Gibbons versus Ogden which really ruled out uh, monopolies or discouraged them. And uh, similarly, uh, decisions uh, that limited the powers of state charters. So if a state chartered a corporation, uh, it didn't prohibit other corporations from similar development programs and, and things like that. And then there were state banking laws, which opened up free banking across the country. This was rather late in the period. 
But uh, earlier on, you had to get an individual charter and you had to pass all sorts of requirements for states to charter banks. Later on, these requirements were generalized so that anyone qualified for the charter was more or less automatically uh, able to set up a bank. There, there were um, in general incorporation laws, which made it uh, possible to set up corporations in general, limited liability laws. Uh, what could encourage someone more to set up a corporation than the fact that you can't personally be sued for bankruptcy if your enterprise fails? So all in all, these things um, encourage uh, entrepreneurs like Moses Yale Beach to gamble. And uh, thus, I think he's very representative of the age of entrepreneurialism. You provide us with, with a very compelling portrait of, of this entrepreneurial spirit and how Beach embodies that to a, an extent and how, how the time was just right for him, how the time was made for this. In, in some ways, you also you look ahead to our next question uh, because you mentioned uh, John Calhoun. So that takes us to the political context. Can you comment on, on the politics of the period and, and statesmen like Daniel Webster, Henry Clay and John Calhoun and the attempt to find legislative solutions to the divisive issue of slavery. I think it's very important to understand this if you want to understand Moses Hale Beach's life, because so many of Beach's columns, uh, in one way or another, had to do with the problem of slavery in North America. Let's go back a bit. Let's, let's remember that the United States Constitution punted the slavery question. The United States Constitution is one of the most misunderstood documents uh, in American history. And I learned that over decades of teaching at Purdue University. I talked to students and what I learned from them in return was a profound misunderstanding of, of the Constitution when it came to slavery, one shared by the American public, which is that the Constitution did not in any way say that all men are created equal. That was something that was written into the Declaration of Independence. Uh, and it was phrasing from Thomas Jefferson and the men who worked with him on drafting the Declaration of Independence. And the US Constitution, in sharp contrast, hardly proclaimed the equality of man. In fact, uh, it didn't make uh, indigenous people, citizens, for instance, or anything of the sort. More importantly, as I said, it punted the slavery question. It didn't even outlaw the African slave trade. That's another misunderstanding. The Constitution said that Congress could, if it wanted to, abolish the slave trade from Africa 20 years later, but didn't have to. It didn't even use the word slavery. There was a fugitive slave clause which supported slavery in those states that still had it, uh, because it was already on the road to abolition in much of the North. The uh, Fugitive Slave Clause, which said you had to return escape enslaved peoples, mm. uh, didn't use the word slavery, persons held to bondage or, or whatever the phrase was. So the whole thing was hunted down the road. The Constitution gave the South enough power in the U.S. government, power that translated into more ability to elect U.S. presidents, more ele ability to elect U.S. congressmen in particular, and, and also ultimately control the Supreme Court. That's why you get the Dred Scott decision later saying that, that, that blacks can't be U.S. citizens. The, the Constitution had this three-fifths clause, which said that even though African-American slaves could not vote in any elections in the South, they still would count to uh, grow the South's representation in Congress. The main point is the Constitution punted the question of slavery down the road, and it was pretty much subsumed by other questions, including the War of 1812, which you mentioned, for a couple of decades. And then the war is done, and the nation is expanding. The revolution, of course, uh, had gotten the US, uh, all the geography, of uh, North America below Canada and above uh, Mexico and, and, and Florida, of course, to the, to the Mississippi River. 
But then uh, of the acquisition of Florida, which came in 1819, and the acquisition of the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, when Jefferson basically gets a, a good share of the land uh, between the, the Mississippi River and the Rocky Mountains for the United States, huge swath of land. Uh, now we've got a real problem because um, the slavery question had been pretty much settled in the East mm. by the end of the War of 1812. The, the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 that was passed just before the Constitution kept slavery out of the area that we consider now the upper Midwest. Uh, in those days, it was called the Old Northwest. Uh, it was the area, uh, really, the, the five states of Ohio, Indiana, uh, Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin. And I'm talking about today's states. Slavery was banned by the Northwest Ordinance. But uh, as, as part of kind of an implicit deal made by uh, Yankees and Southerners earlier in our country to keep the country together, uh, Southerners were allowed to establish slavery in areas, new areas below the Ohio River, like Kentucky and Tennessee, and eventually Mississippi and Alabama. Uh, it's pretty much settled up to the Mississippi River. And then, of course, you've got this huge uh, area up to the Rockies now that begins to be developed. Jefferson, of course, sends out the Lewis and Clark expedition. And even before, decades up after the War of 1812, You've got a new state across the Mississippi River, Missouri, applying for admission to the Union. As far as Southerners are concerned, no deal has been struck about the area across the Mississippi River. They're U.S. citizens. They consider their enslaved uh, workers property. Uh, they felt that they had a right to take their property into any new areas, just like Northerners could take their cattle and wagons, their property. The people in Missouri and the territory there were ready to make it a slave state. There were enough uh, pro-slavery settlers that they sent to uh, the U.S. Congress a, a prospective constitution that would have admitted Missouri as a slave state. In Congress, Northerners opposed this. They didn't feel they made any deal that they would allow uh, slavery west of the Mississippi River. And there were proposals by Northerners to ban uh, slavery in Missouri, that if it wanted to be a state, it would have to uh, prohibit slavery. Uh, there was uh, talk of even civil war back then, breaking up the Union. Uh, Southerners were furious that Northerners would attack their, what they called their, their institutions, their, their way of life and become very defensive about slavery. And finally, a deal is struck by a great American politician from Kentucky, Henry Clay, who became known uh, as the great compromiser for the compromises he would help strike uh, between the North and the South throughout his career. But uh, they strike a deal. Yes, they'll let Missouri in as a slave state, but to balance it so that the South wouldn't get extra power in Congress to protect slavery forever, they're going to admit Maine as a free state. And then, of course, there's the question of what to do with the rest of the Louisiana Purchase, uh, which is a vast, vast area. And so what they agreed on was they would draw a line. It's known as the Missouri Compromise Line in history books across the Missouri's southern boundary all the way through the rest of the Louisiana Territory up to where U.S. possession ended uh, at the Rockies. In this uh, area, north of that line, slavery uh, would be prohibited. South of that line, it could be established in the future. That was roughly the main terms of the, the Missouri Compromise. By the time Moses Yale Beach is a young man, you've got sort of uh, another postponement, another pushing back. Uh, we don't acquire any major land for about two decades after the Missouri Compromise is struck. And so Americans turn inward. We develop a new political party system that's very sharply defined between the Democrats and the Whigs. The Whigs were a totally new party. The Democrats uh, had uh, uh, an anchor in the old Democratic-Republican Party, Thomas Jefferson, 
You have an entirely new political system, which is really, although they do occasionally have to deal with slavery related issues, the most important things dividing Whigs and Democrats are matters of policy. There was a famous bank war between the Democrats and especially President Andrew Jackson, who got rid of the second U.S. bank, uh, and the Whigs, led by Henry Clay and Daniel Webster, who were very pro-bank. That was one of the key issues uh, that divided Whigs and Democrats. And after uh, the uh, second bank was uh, basically uh, extremely weakened uh, by Jackson, you had all sorts of other banking regulations, laws that came in like the the species circular of his successor, Martin Van Buren, Democratic president, who wanted to just use hard metal as currency. Of course, uh, you can imagine what that would be like today. You wouldn't carry any dollar bills around in your pocket, just be hard metal. The banking became a big issue uh, for many years, and we had a depression uh, starting in 1837, partly because of banking issues. And so then the question came, became, how do you get out of the depression? There were sharp disagreements uh, over the tariff. Industrial interests in the country, particularly New England, not all of them, but most of them, uh, supported higher tariffs. That would help their industries uh, fend off, especially imports from Britain, but also other countries. And uh, they wanted to sell homemade goods to Americans. And in a sense, this reflects issues we're dealing with today with China, for instance. Mm -hmm. well, there were big arguments over tariffs and there were high tariffs for a while. There was a, a very serious uh, problem over the tariff in, uh, eight, in 1832, 1833. Uh, South Carolina almost threatened secession over it. They came up with a doctrine called nullification. If you didn't like a federal law, and in South Carolina's case, it was the tariff mm -hmm. law, you could simply uh, nullify it within your state boundaries. You could claim it was unconstitutional and, null and there were special procedures for nullification. And if you did that, it wouldn't be law. Northerners, of course, wanted the tariff. Jackson, even though he was a Southerner, favored uh, enforcing the law over South Carolina. He hated Calhoun, who had a lot to do with this uh, nullification doctrine. Uh, Calhoun had been his own vice president, ironically, led to a big split between Jackson and and, and Calhoun, and uh, there was talk of stringing Calhoun up and so on and so forth. Long story again. Point is, that was an economic issue. It had to do with, in, a, in essence, uh, su subsidizing American industrial growth. But of course, tariffs also affected in the agricultural products and the like. So big issue between the Whigs and the Democrats. And then finally, internal improvements. Whigs tended to inherit the old perspective of Alexander Hamilton, that the federal government ought to support uh, internal improvement, that uh, you could subsidize them in various ways. They had a broad vision of the, of the national development. One of the leading Whigs was John Quincy Adams, the former president. When he had been president, he had wanted a national observatory and a national university and all sorts of things like that. The Democrats were strict constructionists. They believe more in states' rights in most things. And that's why Jackson uh, allowed Georgia really to uh, violate a Supreme Court decision to move uh, their native populations westward in the Trail of Tears, as we know it. The point is, things were divided over economic issues. But we were an expanding nation. We've been an expanding nation since our nation's founding. There have been a 20-year hiatus. And then all of a sudden, in the... 1840s, and Moses Yale Beach is right in the middle of the, the swirl of events, something we can't even imagine today. Uh, when you think of uh, President Trump trying to buy Greenland, it just seems so bizarre the United States would <laughs> try to buy some land from another country. I mean, that was bizarre because we're not used to that kind of thing. But remember, the United States had expanded across almost the whole continent. Uh, by the 1840s, and it had its eyes on the West Coast. Uh, it had its eyes on uh, what we today call the states of Oregon and Washington. At the time, it was the Oregon Territory because we jointly occupied it with Great Britain. We couldn't resolve the boundary issues with Great Britain out there uh, in several prior treaties and conferences and uh, diplomatic initiatives. So we jointly occupied Oregon.
we uh, had our eyes already on California and the Pacific Coast, partly uh, because we were interested in trade uh, with Asia. Texas had declared its independence with the help of U.S. adventurers back in 1835 and then won it in 1836 uh, in the Texas Revolution. Uh, but there had been uh, a process why, whereby Americans had infiltrated into Texas and then joined the Texas Revolutionary Armies. In, in my books, I call these people the filibusters. Uh, that was the term that came into use slightly later. But they, they filibustered into Texas. Texas won its independence with U.S. help. The U.S. government really didn't do a lot to prevent those filibusters from crossing the border illegally. And Texas is an independent republic for about nine years. And we don't annex it, partly because of the slavery problem. Northerners don't want to admit a new slave state to the Union. Texans had rebelled for their independence, partly because the, the Mexican government had passed all sorts of laws and statutes to prevent future slaves from being brought to Texas. There were slaves there already. The, the point is that rather than deal with Texas, even though he was a Southerner, Andrew Jackson had been president and he postponed the Texas issue. Eventually, he recognizes Texan independence, but does not try to get it into the Union. But by 1845, Texas, for various reasons, wanted to join the Union. It will be annexed, and this will bring up the, the slavery issue again. Do you annex Texas with slavery? And then, because Mexico wasn't willing to give Texas up permanently to the United States, even though it had allowed Texas uh, to live as a, as a republic in a kind of limbo state for those nine years. Mexico is primed for war with the United States, and Mexico owns a large share of the land between the Mississippi River and the Pacific that the United States doesn't own yet. And then uh, Cuba becomes an issue by this time for various reasons. And independently of Texas itself, the state of Yucatan in Mexico is interested in annexation to the United States for various reasons. By the mid-1840s, the French have started thinking about building a canal across Panama that uh, might give them control of trade between the Atlantic and the Pacific, and that could lead to the French dominance of the Gulf of Mexico. All sorts of things are going on, swirling around at once. And uh, so Moses Yale Beat and the Sun are in the middle of this, and there are countless columns on the slavery question, on uh, the Isthmus, on Tehuantepec, on, uh, on Yucatan, on Cuba, on Mexico, on Texas annexation, and all that. And, in fact, on the Oregon question with Great Britain, because it's coming to a head. And those of you watching this who have uh, heard the, uh, the phrase 5440 or fight, that's, that's it's one of those things like, don't give up the ship. You know, it's one of those key phrases in American history. And that dates from the Oregon controversy. So Beach is in the middle of, of all this. The slavery question can't be postponed any longer because of all these territorial questions that overwhelm the economic questions that had divided Whigs and Democrats for so long. And, and of course, the, the parties don't entirely divide over the slavery question. But Beach is in the middle of this. And right at the time that he gets involved personally in a mission, a diplomatic mission during the Mexican War, a representative, a congressman from Pennsylvania named David Wilmot, gets up in Congress and says that President Polk wants the money to continue the war in, uh, in Mexico. And there are shades of Ukraine right there and current Republican threats to cut off U.S. funding mm -hmm. for Ukraine. Uh, Wilmot proposes that uh, uh, slavery not be allowed in any land we might acquire from Mexico during the Mexican War. Uh, otherwise, Wilmot will pro prohibit us from getting any land uh, as a result of the U.S.-Mexican War. As a result of all this, uh, the Wilmot Proviso is going to come up for votes over and over and uh, over again. Moses Yale Beach is going to be in the middle and his paper will be in the middle. You very, very carefully demonstrate why you are regarded as an expert.
on these internal logistics uh, of the history of, of America's uh, westward expansion, but you are also at the forefront and very much a trendsetter in looking at what was happening elsewhere to understand America. And in many ways, your very informed response now does uh, uh, set up this next question for us. So why is a global perspective important, especially as it relates to America's expansion? Let's think of uh, Beach, for instance, and those issues that I just talked about. You can, you can talk about American expansion very ethnocentrically. Uh, you can go back to the fact that our original colonial charters, uh, some of them, not all of them, actually gave th those uh, modest-sized colonies on the Atlantic coast that Britain had, like uh, Virginia. They got these immense land grants to the Pacific Ocean. Several of them had these kinds of land. You could say expansion was built into America's DNA from the initial founding of the colonies. And then it's easy enough to see that once we became a new nation, our founding fathers inherited these colonial attitudes. Uh, John Winthrop said aboard the Arabella, the ship that bore the initial Puritans to New England and their settlement, said we shall be a city on a hill and all the eyes of the world will be upon us. So uh, he had a very, in a sense, ethnocentric view of what they were doing as the center of, of the human enterprise. You can look at American history, its development and its expansion in a, in a very ethnocentric lens. Um, you get to the early nation, you realize that our founding fathers thought this way. Uh, Jedediah Morris wrote one of our early textbooks, American Geography. Even though we didn't yet own the land across the Mississippi River, we talked about an eventual American empire across the uh, Mississippi River. And, and finally, uh, by the 1840s, uh, you had Americans talking about manifest destiny. The term manifest destiny or has been attributed through uh, most historical scholarship to one of Moses Beach's accomplices in the uh, Pony Express and in the setting up of the Associated Press uh, fellow New York newspaperman, John L. O'Sullivan, who not only edited the United States Magazine and Democratic Review, which came out monthly, but he edited Morning News in New York. The news came up with editorials in 1845 having to do with Texas and Oregon uh, that uh, used the term manifest destiny. But there were similar phrases used uh, not only in O'Sullivan's publications, but in earlier statements uh, in, in other media. The idea of manifest destiny was in the air. More recently, uh, it's been suggested through textual analysis that O'Sullivan's original use of the term manifest destiny was really by his uh, uh, writer, Jane Casno, who went with Moses Beach on his Mexican mission. Jane Casno, who at the time was Jane Storm, wrote editorials for Beach as well as letters to the sun. So that phrase has been attributed to Jane Storm through textual analysis. That is to say, you analyze her writings uh, mm -hmm. under her name, and then you assess, uh, was published as Manifest Destiny in uh, you know, O'Sullivan's uh, papers, unattributed columns in which uh, O'Sullivan did not actually sign the columns. And people have said Jane Storm wrote mm -hmm. the phrase Manifest Destiny. That, that's really less important than the phrase itself. The phrase itself meant that God, providence, had destined the United States. It's manifest, it's obvious, and the, and the word providence was inserted into the phrasing that, that the United States would expand across the entire uh, con continent. It was God's will. You know, you can look at all this very ethnocentrically, but in fact, every single expansion issue that faced both Moses Yale Beach and Jane Storm has no. All those issues can't be understood without a global perspective. Mm -hmm. You can't understand how we eventually got Oregon without understanding our growing interest in trade with Hawaii, in uh, trade with Asia. The famous Perry expedition to opening up Japan only occurs a few years 
uh, after uh, Beach's expedition to Mexico during the Mexican War. We, we've been trading with China since the 1790s. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of money to be made in that trade. And, and Britain's uh, interested, uh, especially in the fur pelt trade with Asia and the Pacific. And that's why uh, you have the Hudson Bay Company, which, uh, uh, you know, trapping beaver and so on. Uh, out in the West, and then uh, you're uh, you're going to trade with Asia for uh, their products. Uh, and the U.S. was involved in this. The, the whaling trade out of the Pacific, the Pacific uh, was very important to the United States. The point is, we were interested in Pacific trade. So were the British. We both wanted to control the Oregon Territory. And you certainly can't uh, understand... Uh, the, the crisis with Britain that erupted suddenly in 1846 when uh, President James Polk uh, declared the joint occupation with Britain was ending. What's going to come next? A war? Uh, you can't understand why he would initiate a crisis like this without understanding the, the broader global stakes involved in, in Asia. You can't understand why suddenly John Tyler, who was president before James K. Polk, would be interested in, in Texas without understanding the global implications of what was going on with Great Britain, uh, the uh, African slave trade, uh, Cuba, and Texas. What happened in the cases of both our growing interest in Cuba and our growing interest in Texas was that American leaders, but Southern leaders in particular, feared that Great Britain would pressure Spain into abolishing slavery in Cuba. Spain still owned Cuba at this point, And that it would pressure Texas into ending slavery in Texas as the price uh, of staying independent. And Mexico was putting a lot of pressure on Texas by the mid 1840s, there was the danger that Mexico would try to reconquer Texas. There were rumors and actual reports from US diplomats abroad that Britain was saying to Texas, okay, you want your independence, we'll be, we'll be the middlemen. We will arrange things so that Mexico will finally formally recognize your independence, free you from the danger of war. You will end slavery in Texas. And similarly, there were fears that Britain intended to end slavery in Cuba. Number one, Cuba is one of the centers of the African slave trade in, in the whole world, and certainly in the Western Hemisphere. The African slave trade has been uh, illegal internationally for a long time. The U.S. has uh, agreed to uh, treaties against the African slave trade. We've prohibited it by law. Uh, as of 1808, but they are importing a lot of slaves into Cuba that eventually wind up uh, into Brazil or into the United States illegally, but especially into Cuba. And Cuba's become a great uh, slaveholding society. Uh, some of the slaves are there legally, many of them are imported later, because unlike the United States, which had a slave population that reproduced itself, uh, the slave population in, in most of Latin America would have died out because of more horrible tropical working conditions had it not been for infusions of newly uh, chained uh, slaves from Africa uh, in, in, onto ships and into uh, Cuba. These new slaves come into Cuba. They're illegal under international law. The Brits are especially anxious, far more anxious than we are, to eradicate slavery in Cuba. Why? Uh, well, for one thing, the U U.S. has, uh, Southerners dominate the U.S. government. A lot of the presidents are Southerners. Uh, they, they have control, uh, especially of the U.S. Senate. And they fairly, have, have pretty much controlled the U.S. Supreme Court. Southerners, they're, they're very uh, worried when talk comes up about slavery ending in Cuba under British pressure. What might that mean? We had had uh, the Nat Turner Rebellion back in 1831. 
There had been a major slave rebellion plot in Charleston, South Carolina in 1822. There had been a slave plot known as the Gabriel Plot in Virginia in 1800. The, the worst thing of all for white Southerners, in terms of long-term memory, thousands of uh, French whites who died uh, in the Black Revolution in what became Haiti. What's going to happen if you have large numbers of Blacks not only free in Cuba, but eventually taking governmental power, perhaps taking up arms? Even if, even if the British just succeed in freeing the legally imported blacks, they may get too much power in Cuba, they may overthrow the slave system, and that might trigger or inspire slaves uh, in the United States to rebel for freedom. Enslaved people in the U.S. know what's going on in the, all over the Caribbean basin. Black sailors arrive, especially on British ships. Uh, they're free black sailors and they bear news when there's a revolt or resistance in the West Indies. There was a black uh, revolt in Cuba uh, in 1844. There were all sorts of uh, earlier revolts and a British abolitionist named David Turnbull had been consul in Cuba for a while. At any rate, uh, there's a great fear of uh, Britain intervening in Cuba as well as Texas and it's spilling over into the United States. One of the authors whom uh, Professor uh, Opelt uh, mentioned uh, has pointed out in her book uh, about runaway slaves to Mexico, Alice Baumgartner, Texas was a real worry, not just uh, that if slavery were abolished there, uh, it might become another free state or anything like that, but just even uh, under Mexican rule and then independence, a fugitive slaves could run away to Mexico. Uh, and uh, Mexico had uh, abolished slavery. There was a fear if Texas abolished slavery, that would mean fugitive slaves in places like Mississippi could easily uh, escape into freedom by crossing into Texas. But even if Texas stays uh, a slave republic, uh, they can uh, go into Mexico, and they are going into Mexico. So there were all sorts of things going on uh, that meant that the slavery question could no longer be suppressed and why you have to have a global perspective. The French, as I think I mentioned earlier, have started thinking about a canal across uh, Central America. The United States wants to control the whole Caribbean uh, economically. What happens if you start getting charged tolls to go through a canal? What happens if uh, there, there are higher tariffs in these areas? Uh, Cuba had very high tariffs because Spain controlled it. If the U.S. got control of Cuba, tariffs would go down. Uh, there were all sorts of port regulations that interfered with U.S. ships and gave preference to Spanish ships in Cuba. There were all sorts of economic reasons and other uh, reasons, particularly the issue of slavery, that all had to do with global conditions that uh, forced Americans finally to come to terms with Oregon. With, with Texas, with Mexico, uh, with Cuba, with Central America in the mid-1840s and help explain uh, the New York Sun and help to explain Moses Yale Beach. As you end that, that fascinating passage of information on Moses Yale Beach, let us, let us go back to our, our historical man on the ground here. Um, you, you provide us this, this very, very compelling take on Mexico and on Cuba, and now let's uh, let's place Moses Yale Beach back there. So, you've already shed light for us on his involvement in the Mexican War um, and his 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 presence there very much. Now, let's take it back to to Cuba, um, and you've just discussed Cuba with us. So, in addition to being immersed uh, in the peacemaking of the U.S. Mexican War, as as you've shared with us. Moses Yale Beach played a possibly even more significant role in U.S. attempts to acquire Cuba from Spain. Now, could you elaborate on this less well-known facet of Beach's very colorful career? I would like to start with a, a quote from Beach. This is an editorial he writes on March 2nd, 1848. So the Mexican War is still going on. And he writes this in the New York Sun. And he says, are we to give Mexico back to her military despots? We have conquered much of Mexico by this time. 
are all passages to the Pacific Ocean to be handed over to England? Is that all-important isthmus to be formed into another mosquito country? This was a protectorate that, that Great Britain had over part of the British coast. Now, you remember Britain's involved in Cuba also. You put it all together. This shows Beach's linking of all these issues together uh, during the U.S.-Mexican War in one editorial, really, although he doesn't specifically mention Cuba, and how fitting it is that when he goes to Mexico as a State Department agent, he gets appointed a special agent at six bucks a day, plus traveling expenses, to go down to Mexico. He doesn't go alone. His Spanish isn't all that good. He takes with him this woman, Jane Storm, as well as his own daughter, Drusilla, uh, to Mexico. Uh, and uh, Jane Storm's already been writing for him. She's been promoting Texas annexation. The, uh, the Sun had been one of the leading papers in calling for Texas, which, of course, has this link to the Cuba situation that I've already gone into. He takes her along partly because of her understanding of Spanish, plus she's Catholic. She's converted to Catholicism. Both she and he have links to the New York Catholic hierarchy, particularly Bishop John Hughes of New York. What seems to have prompted this trip to Mexico originally, which is going to have a Cuba component, Catholic leaders in Mexico, as, as well as some conservative Mexican leaders who don't like the way the war is going and would like peace with the United States, partly because Mexico is running out of means, money to fight the war. And there are similar fears to what we today see regarding the ability of Ukraine and Russia both to keep up the war financially. They're afraid, as a result, in Mexico to keep funding going for the war will start taxing Mexican church property, Mexican Catholic church property, was, which was extensive. So various interests in Mexico are interested in making peace. And they seem to have gotten word to the United States, to New York, through contacts in Zachary Taylor's army, which was fighting in northern Mexico. This was the U.S. Army that had already conquered much of northern Mexico. They get word uh, to New York they're interested in striking a peace deal over the heads of the Mexican government then in control. Moses Yale Beach, along with Jane Storm, go down to Mexico. But they don't go directly there trying to reach a peace deal. And it's very interesting. President Polk actually writes in his, his diary that Beach doesn't have permission to strike a peace deal with Mexico. He's not, in other words, an accredited diplomat. He's just a secret agent. But that if he happens to strike a peace deal and he thinks Beach has that kind of thing in mind, he'll go along with it. He'll certainly take it into consideration. He says this in his diary. So Beach goes down there. In addition, you've got this wonderful mixing of personal financial gain uh, and uh, U.S. government interests, federal interests. The government is interested in setting up a transit route across uh, the isthmus of Central America and maybe across southern Mexico, where it's very narrow. You could maybe dig a canal. You could maybe just construct a road that would get goods and people across Mexico very quickly to the Pacific, where ships could pick them up and take them to uh, California, which we or were in the process of trying to conquer a railroad, maybe. Anything's possible. Beach is sent down with this idea, well, you might get a, a six-mile stretch across the isthmus of Tehuantepec. Beach had contacts with various commercial interests trying to develop a transit route across Central America that I think he undoubtedly would have profited from if this thing had come to pass. Oh, and, and the government would have subcontracted whatever came out. Uh, Beach has an interest in the isthmus. He also 
uh, comes down with the idea of chartering a national bank of Mexico. Mexico's in debt to foreign powers. The U.S. banking system is stabilized by 1846 when the U.S.-Mexican War starts. And perhaps Beach, with funds provided from his New York banks and, and New Jersey interests and so on, could set up a national bank of Mexico that would handle all of Mexico's debt, would disperse Mexican funds, and so on and so forth. And of course, Beach would profit from this, uh, as, as well as the Mexican government. This is part of the deal. And Polk definitely knows that Beach is involved in this kind of stuff when he sends him down there. And they go buy a Cuba. In Cuba, a lot of very interesting things happen. Number one, they meet with a Mexican official who gives them a letter of introduction to Mexico's vice president. Number two, they meet with a British diplomat in Cuba, and the British diplomat gives all three of them British passports so that when they go to Mexico, they can pretend to be British citizens. For all the Mexicans know if they should be intercepted on the coast or inland, going to, on their way to Mexico City uh, to, to deal with the Mexican Congress and so on and so forth. They're Brits, they're not Americans, that's the hope. And number three, we know from later documents that were written by Jane herself, as well as by Beach himself, that when they land in Cuba, not only does Jane Storm go traveling around the island so that she can write all sorts of travel pieces on her time in Cuba, the later get published in the New York Sun, I think she writes uh, something like 16 letters from Cuba that will get published in the months, uh, uh, both during and after her trip to, to Cuba. But the two of them meet with members of a dissatisfied white Cuban block of leaders, especially planters, known as the Club de la Habana or Havana Club, uh, and uh, there's some incredible uh, personal ties involved between not only Beach, but John L. O'Sullivan, his cohort in Manifest Destiny, uh, and uh, uh, these uh, Cuban planters who are beginning to think that rather than risk a slave rebellion that might be inspired by the British, in the island and all the instability and bloodshed, that they'd be much more stable under U.S. rule. The only major slave rebellion in all of U.S. history uh, since independence had been the Nat, the Nat Turner uh, rebellion uh, in Virginia. And there had been a, an important insurrection in Louisiana territory earlier. But basically the United States had a much more stable a slave society with much more governmental power to protect slavery. And so there was an interest in annexing Cuba to the United States among many a Cuban Creole. Creoles were the second or third generation, not, not Spanish immigrants to Cuba. So they had less of a tie to Spain. They also resented Spanish laws that discriminated against cre uh, uh, Creoles as opposed to the Peninsulares, the settlers who were born in Spain and lived there and were given certain kinds of uh, political and economic benefits they didn't have. For a, a million different reasons, there were Cubans interested in annexation. And we know that at least one meeting transpired uh, during Moses Yale Beach's time in Cuba when he and apparently Jane Casno, if uh, we take Beach's editorial we to mean him and Casno, and I think that's more, much more logical than uh, him and his daughter, uh, he says he meets with members of this Havana club at the Aldama estate. Now, Aldama was a, a Cuban planter. And also there at this meeting, we know, curiously enough, was, was John L. O'Sullivan. Now, he didn't have an official U.S. Uh, secret agent appointment, but he's there at the same time. Why is he there? Well, first of all, his... A sister and married a Cuban planter named Cristobal Madan, who was a member of the Havana Club in uh, 
1846, and he decides to take his honeymoon in January 1846 in Cuba, right, and in Havana, right mm -hmm. when Moses Beach is on the scene. And it's kind of hard to tell how much of this had been arranged in advance, but O'Sullivan's there on his honeymoon, Beach is there on his Mexican mission, and not only that, They'll go to Mexico, of course, afterwards, but when they leave Mexico, they, they leave Mexico separately, and Jane Storm goes back to Cuba. And, and uh, I think she meets at this time with the US consul, Robert Campbell, uh, and possibly John Thrasher, who was an American who ran an English language paper. It had, it had a Spanish edition uh, in, uh, in Havana. Uh, the important point is uh, she will go back to Cuba a second time. And in these meetings, what, what comes out of it is not just that Beach and Storm will support Cuban annexation to the United States and Cuban independence uh, from Spain, of course, as a precursor, but they will also support Cuban media pro-independence media in the United States, pro-annexation media. And they will support, the Cuban planners will kick in about 30,000 bucks to set up three pro-annexation Cuban newspapers in the United States, one of them in New York, uh, which will be under Jane Storm's editorship in the early stages. It will become known as La Verdad or the, the Truth in New York. So they will underwrite her newspaper. There's a huge Cuban revolutionary element in New York that will support this newspaper and eventually help her edit it and uh, eventually take paper over and she'll become more of a correspondent and a column writer. This seems to have been worked out between these different meetings. This is about Oh, two thirds of a year or so into the uh, U.S. Mexican War, the United States has conquered most of northern Mexico. A battle is pending, famous Battle of Buena Vista, which will be the last major battle in northern Mexico on the route to the U.S. conquest of northern Mexico during the war, much of which we will eventually keep. Meanwhile, the Polk administration is planning to conquer the rest of Mexico using Hernando Cortez's original route through central Mexico to Mexico City, the capital. And uh, so following the Spanish conquistadors uh, and uh, going that route into Mexico, in other words, uh, catching Mexico City in kind of a vise with Taylor up north, holding the uh, uh, Mexican forces in place up there. And uh, a new army is going to invade in the south under General Winfield Scott, He'll capture Veracruz and then go inland. Well, in the meantime, in uh, January, after their doings in Cuba, Storm and Moses Yale Beach and Drusilla show up on the coach. The Mexicans actually are suspicious that they're up to no good. And they uh, uh, take them into temporary, especially Beach, they take into temporary custody as uh, potential spy, they search all their baggage, and then the Mexican officials uh, let them go on to Mexico City, where they will make contact with Mexican clergy. Uh, they will make contact with uh, members of the Mexican Congress. Beach himself will eventually claim that it's their prodding that helps lead to a uh, revolt in the capital. There's a military uprising in the capital to overthrow the Mexican government because Santa Ana has been let back into the country, stupidly by President Pope. That's a whole other story. Uh, he's gone to Northern Mexico. He attacked our armies at Buena Vista. And eventually uh, Buena Vista, which could have been a disaster for the Americans, wound up being a victory. And uh, what Santa Ana had done was he had, instead of staying in Northern Mexico, he had done this incredible march uh, from Buena Vista down to the capital of Mexico City, put his men through hell to get down there to help in the defense of Mexico City. Meanwhile, he couldn't send troops to help on the coast, fend off the U.S. attack on the coast. 
And the reason he couldn't, Beach claimed, was Beach kept 5,000 troops in Mexico City uh, involved because of this uprising he helped finance uh, with the funds he had been supplying. To make a long story short, Beach and Storm are both in Mexico City. Beach feels he has to get word to General Scott on the coast, who has put Vera Cruz under siege, and he sends Jane Storm back to the coast, and she will wind up watching the U.S. attack on Vera Cruz from a U.S. vessel in the harbor. She'll meet with Scott. Scott doesn't like the idea of being told by a woman about what's going on in Mexico City as, as Beach's messenger. And he dismisses her as a kind of, uh, he calls her a plenipotentiary, a diplomat in petticoats. The, the mission goes on with Beach in Mexico City for a short while until uh, Santa Ana's return. And then it becomes obvious that he's running a serious risk of being taken as a spy. Uh, so he and Drusilla flee at night. They leave their bags behind. Uh, they have a risky venture trying to get to the coast. And rather than go all the way to Veracruz, they go to a more northern port, Tampico, which is under U.S. control already. Uh, and then he will go back to the United States, whereas Jane Storm will go on, as I've mentioned, uh, to Cuba. Now, what this mission unleashes is about nine or 10 years of U.S. diplomacy to annex Cuba that has all sorts of implications. And it might not have happened without Moses Beach uh, and the Sun and Jane Storm because Beach and O'Sullivan have agreed to, between them, put pressure on Polk to buy Cuba as does Jane Storm with her columns for the annexation of Cuba that she writes in The Sun and other newspapers. Uh, and uh, Jane Storm goes and talks to Polk privately after she gets back from Cuba. Beach goes to talk to Polk, so does O'Sullivan. President Polk's under pressure to buy Cuba he doesn't do so immediately in 1847, but the next year, O'Sullivan goes back with the important senator, uh, Stephen Douglas of Illinois, and they put pressure on Polk to buy Cuba, and Polk and his Secretary of State Buchanan eventually capitulate, and after cabinet discussions, they agree to make a formal effort to buy Cuba from Spain. Meanwhile, Jane Casno has gotten La Verdad off and running. It's, it's off the press in New York City. And guess whose press publishes uh, La Verdad? It was, it was a dual language newspaper that had columns in Spanish, columns in English. It was set up primarily to support the incorporation of Cuba into the United States. Moses Beach runs it off the New York Sun's printing presses. And not only that, when they develop a flag for Cuban independence, a flag that would be borne by U.S. and, and uh, Cuban exile, but mostly U.S. adventurer filibusters who will leave American shores several times over the next uh, few years. There will be actual invasions of Cuba from American shores in 1849 and in 1851. Well, the flag they carry is uh, first really raised uh, from the offices of La Verdad and the New York Sun. And, and the uh, office for, the, uh, for, for La Verdad, it's right across the street from the Sun offices. So this is kind of like Sisters in Crime. Spain will turn down the attempt to purchase. In 1854, the U.S. government, under a different Democratic president, which remember the, the New York Sun, Beach's Sun, is a, is a pro-democratic newspaper, even though it's technically independent of the Democratic Party. Uh, a new Democratic Party president will try to buy Cuba, President Franklin Pierce. There'll be a new attempt to invade Cuba that will be put together between 1853 and 1855. 
of the Pierce administration diplomats who were instructed to come up with a plan to uh, get Cuba annexed to the United States. They propose that uh, if, if Spain won't sell Cuba, then the United States has a right, a right, I would emphasize, to detach it from Spain, in other words, to conquer it for itself. Uh, and why would they have that right? Well, there was a real danger that Spain, under British pressure, was going to Africanize the island. This was code, or today we might call it urban slang, uh, for uh, <clears throat> the idea that Britain would finally force Spain to free all black people imported into Cuba uh, in violation of the international statutes against the slave trade, and maybe even emancipate all Cuban slaves. Uh, that would set up a tremendous threat. Southern slaves would find out from sailors and other sources. Uh, some of them were literate. Uh, sooner or later, they'd see newspapers with headlines. They would find out that uh, that Cuban slaves had gotten their freedom. And this would inspire them uh, maybe to run away. They could flee by boat to Cuba if they could get their hands on, on a boat. They could go 90 miles. They might rebel for their independence in the United States. They'd be so inspired by this rich slaveholding island, which produced much of the world's coffee and sugar, uh, suddenly becoming free for blacks. Threat of Africanization, they said. The United States had a right to seize Cuba. And, of course, northern anti-slavery interests are infuriated. And uh, the Pierce administration has to disavow the Ostend Manifesto. It basically takes steps to prevent any filibuster expeditions from reaching. Uh, it refuses to deploy U.S. military power against Spain. And uh, the whole effort to purchase Cuba collapses again. For the Civil War, the Buchanan administration will try to buy Cuba. Uh, we're straying here a little bit from Moses Beach, but I would add that Moses Beach's son, Moses Ferry Beach, took over the New York Sun after Moses Sr. gave up active editorship of it. And he developed a very close relationship with Jane Storm. And there are many letters from Jane Storm to Moses Ferry Beach in the Brewster Beach Family Papers collection. And the New York Sun continued through this period to support Cuban annexation, the Cuban exiles in the United States, uh, and um, the idea of annexing Cuba and of shrugging off, as Jane Storm did, the uh, whole issue of uh, slavery. We need to remember that uh, the Sun was one, not one of the United States's anti-slavery newspapers, because you couldn't have Cuba both ways. It was very clear that if Cuba was going to come into the Union and satisfy Southern demands for new slave states, and there was some talk of making it into two slave states, and we should note that after the admission of Florida to the United States as a state in 1845, and, and Texas in at the end of 1845, there would be no more slave states admitted to the Union, while all sorts of states would be admitted that outlawed slavery to the Union between 1845 and the Civil War, including Oregon. You, you take all this into consideration, and uh, it was very clear that if Cuba was going to come into the Union to appease the South, it would have to come in as one or more slave states. And the sun is in the middle of this. It's willing to shrug off the slave question in return for keeping the union together. And um, the Sun will promote this idea, and it will even publish columns by Jane Casnone. She's married. In fact, Cuba could be the answer to America's slavery problem. It was a specious argument, but basically what Casnone and like-minded people argued was that Cuba could be a great safety valve. When Americans got tired of slavery and wanted to get rid of them, they could shuffle them off to the tropics, uh, first to Texas and then into Mexico and also into Cuba. And uh, it would be a way for America to resolve its
uh, slavery problem. And she'd eventually come even to say that uh, the Dominican Republic would be a way to end America's race problem. Uh, blacks could go down to the Dominican Republic. Storm, beach are interconnected in Mexico. Mm -hmm. They're interconnected in Cuba. They're interconnected with both the Mexican and Cuban questions after they get back to the United States because Beach's newspaper will not only promote uh, the whole idea of 54, 40, or 5, we should annex all Oregon, it will promote the annexation of Texas, it will enact, uh, promote the annexation of all of Mexico. And Jane Storm's columns will first suggest we should get part of Mexico, but she will come around to all Mexico also and write columns for all Mexico. They're linked intrinsically together to the Mexican War, to U.S. territorial expansion, to Manifest Destiny, to Cuba, which never was annexed, and uh, finally uh, to uh, the uh, slavery question in the United mm. States and in New York City. A completely absorbing entanglement of people and place and, and space, time, history. And, and moving through this, this, this history, as, as you so finely detail, is this supernova of intrigue, if I can call it that, that is Jane Storm. You, you present to us a person here, especially in your, in your writing on, on Jane Storm, who, um, firstly for our viewers, Jane Storm uh, was the most prolific female journalist on U.S. foreign policy uh, during the antebellum. And she was certainly not lacking uh, in self-confidence, as, as you've already uh, demonstrated for us. And your work also reveals the study of a woman who rather fearlessly defied the, uh, the separate spheres ideology of the time that sought to keep women framed within the house or the home or within the framework of the domestic. Uh, we have encountered an 1846 quote attributed to her that reads, and I quote, I can do and control over half of the entire circulation of the New York Sun, and from my position thus hold the balance of opinion on any man or measure, end quote. Now, this is certainly a very, very interesting and provocative quote. Um, firstly, how, how does this quote strike you? And secondly, um, actually, no, I think just that, that question covers it. How does that quote strike you? How does that sum up Jane Storm for you? That is really perfect. I became so intrigued with this uh, woman, and I've written uh, a, a number of books that discuss Jane Casno, Jane Storm Casno, but there is a wonderful biography of her uh, that covers her whole life by Linda Hudson. But in my work on, on, on Jane Storm, what, what amazed me the most was her presumptuousness, her effrontery. Uh, she wrote an incredible number of letters to not only newspapers, so you see her published in the Baltimore Sun, Philadelphia papers, Washington papers, New York papers, uh, the famous Louisville Courier Journal editor, Henry Watterson, uh, said that he was an apprentice on the Washington States with Jane Casneau, uh, or he met her there. And, I, and, and I don't know if that's true or not, it probably is. I would say that she wrote letters for probably a dozen or so different newspapers over time, maybe more. Uh, it's absolutely remarkable. More than that, she thought nothing, not just of writing opinion pieces for newspapers and expecting to be published, but of writing politicians directly. So it's very clear from her letters that she tried to establish a relationship with uh, President Polk. Uh, he wrote in his diary that he didn't think he learned much from his one hour conversation with her. Uh, but nonetheless, he said he listened to her attentively and he, he, she didn't get that far with him, but she had established a relationship and did establish a relationship with James Buchanan, the Senator from Pennsylvania, who became US Secretary of State and President uh, and uh, she had a very close relationship with James Buchanan. And she would think nothing of saying something like, uh, I'm coming around to see you tonight on a given issue, and I'll expect you to receive me at such and such a time, and you can't say no. I mean, I actually read a letter to that effect uh, between her and James Buchanan. She had a relationship like that with the Secretary of the Navy, George Bancroft, under uh, 
Pope. She wrote letters to William Marcy, the Secretary of War, later U.S. Secretary of State. She wrote a large numbers of letters to the famous William Seward, uh, Lincoln Secretary of State, who uh, was a U.S. Senator when many of her letters were written and uh, who eventually, of course, would be best known for his purchase of Alaska. I could go on and on with the number of very important people who she visited with and uh, told what to do. I can remember some letters to, to Seward. One of the things about Jane Storm that's fascinating is that she was fascinated with underclasses. And she stuck up for working people in New York. She was very interested in working women in New York. And uh, it wasn't so much that she was pro-union as that she wanted women to compete in uh, skilled trades and, and get into book publishing and things like, like that, dressmaking and, and, and so on. She was interested in the labor movement in New York. And she, she also she was very interested in the problem of peonage out in the Southwest. Uh, out in uh, western Texas, and she lived for a while in El Paso, uh, New Mexico. Uh, a lot of laborers were impoverished people from what had once been Mexico that we conquered or took over. In, in the case of Texas, we annexed it by a joint resolution of Congress that was later recognized uh, in the treaty ending the U.S.-Mexican War. Uh, she got very interested in these people who weren't much better off than enslaved black people in the American South. Uh, they were in debt to large white estate owners who employed them to grow crops primarily, uh, but they, they could also be used in, in mineral uh, developments and, and, and in mining. Uh, and uh, these uh, peon laborers, could be worked at will until they paid off their debts. Now, since the, the payments were always very low pay and uh, they uh, were charged for their upkeep and so on, they could be in debt to people virtually for life. She wanted a treaty signed between the United States and Mexico outlawing peonage, and she fought for it. And uh, she, she would write letters to Seward, for instance, who was a Whig. She would say, I'll make this a partisan issue if I have to, and I'll get the Democrats fighting peonage and winning votes uh, with my columns. And uh, that's the kind of thing she did. She uh, had a, uh, a lot of effrontery. It's, it's, it's hard to know what to make of this, uh, this woman. Did she play off her looks at all? There are a couple of descriptions of her as, quote, comely. I get the feeling that she was non, non-sexual. One U.S. politician said she had a masculine stomach for politics. Uh, it's, it's really hard to know if she ever played off her femininity. She's there for almost all Americans to discover because although academics now know about uh, Jane Storm Kasno, I don't think she's a name on the tip of the tongue of the uh, typical American, as much as uh, Moses Yale Beach, for all of the, those of us who study him and uh, grow to find him absolutely fascinating, uh, I don't think he's on the, the tips of the tongue of most Americans. And I do think most Americans by now have probably heard of Manifest Destiny, but I don't think the public has even heard of John L. O'Sullivan. In wrapping up, I'm going to ask you a question that, that returns us slightly to, to our core subject, Mo, Moses Yale Beach, but then also shows entanglements, uh, hopefully with, with uh, some work that you've already contributed. This, this question has to do with, it takes us back to, to the AP, and I'm beginning to wonder now that with the AP and this important legacy that it left behind of of truthful, of uh, fair, accurate news coverage that today gets, that's turned around when we're stuck perhaps more than ever in ecosystems of slanted news coverage or what just a few years ago was still called post-truth, where we are stuck in these ecosystems of, of unreality, so to speak. 
if I rewind the clock now, um, in your groundbreaking work on, on filibustering in, in the 19th century America, which we have here, Manifest Destiny's Underworld, it's in our bookshelf, it is striking to realize how often, especially in earlier examples of filibustering that you detail, um, such as during the 1812 war and through the 1837 Patriot Uprisings in Canada, there is what we call fake news, um, playing such prominent parts in battle tactics through false reports to manipulate perceptions. Uh, often such false reportage seem to be down to the time it took for, for news to spread. So we can simply call these lies, obviously, and acknowledge that they are part of human history and human nature. But I'm now wondering whether the Telegraph and its innovation for newspapers, especially as Moses Yale Beach saw it, played a part in mitigating such practices and creating, as it were, fairer battlefields, if we could call it that. Um, in your knowledge, do you think news coverage improved as of the 1840s? That's uh, probably the, the toughest question you've asked, simply because news was so biased. Uh, I, I just don't know that, that I could give a, a firm answer on the press becoming more genuinely objective by the Civil War. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for that. On a closing note, in addition to just our, our sheer and utter gratitude for the valuable insights and just the lens you, you, you apply to help us understand history so much better, I, I see a connection between the way you help us understand parts of history that perhaps have been a bit more obscured for us it, it does link into, I think, what has been a lifelong career project for you to expand really our understanding of, of American westward expansion. It moves throughout most of your work. Uh, certainly you've been at the forefront of this. So it's not as if this is uh, something you're only saying now, although I do think of, of some of your recent writing. Uh, you suggest uh, that current history or social study curriculums could benefit from specific correctives. Um, to accepted understandings that have been taught for years. In that sort of understanding, it is even more compelling to see the ways we can approach or reapproach history. Uh, you've shaped that for us just by discussing Moses Yale Beach, but certainly uh, there are more extensions to this. So thank you for helping us understand this uh, before the Civil War period in America. It provides us with some insight into our subject of interest, Moses Yale Beach. And thank you again for sharing your extensive expertise with us. It's been a delight working. With you.